this morning, I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Luke, the 16th chapter. We're going to be looking at the first 15 verses in a continuation of stories that Jesus has told. They're called parables. And I entitled the entire series, Connecting Heaven with Earth. Because a parable is an earthly story that has a heavenly meaning. An earthly story, something that is very familiar with all of us, at least in the day that Jesus told these, they were very familiar, like the man who goes out and sows seed. I mean, I'm not a farmer, so I have a little difficult time relating to that story. The story of the Good Samaritan who finds someone on the side of the road, and the day that we live in, the last thing you want to do is pick up somebody from the side of the road. But in the days that these were given, they were, they were common, fleshly stories, but they had a, a twist to them. They had a meaning that was beyond the apparent. Sometimes Jesus even pulls his disciples aside and he says, do you understand what I'm talking about? And then they looked at him with these deer in the headlights, you know, kind of eyes. And, and, and of course they said, well, yes, we do. Not understanding a word that he just got finished saying. Like many of us, like very many of us, that the preacher gets up here and he talks and he ramps and he raves. And when it's all said and done, you say, what was he talking about? I can never forget that I came up here to speak, and I, I have a hearing problem. And I wear these little hearing aids, and, and this morning I turned them up just a little bit so that I don't blast you out of here. But I remember coming up here, you know, and, and, I got, and the little kids up here in the front, their eyes got great old big, you know, and they looked over at Virginia and says, what's he mad about? Why is he so upset? Well, I have a tendency that when I get excited, I get louder and faster and louder. And Anyway, this morning, the parable of the shrewd manager found in Luke chapter number 16. Let's look at the passage this morning. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and he asked him, what is this that I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be and I'm going to interject, my manager any longer. We understand that as um, getting your walking papers, right? I won't give a raise of hands of how many of us have been fired from a job. But um, there's a few of you that got fired from your dad. I've heard the story. And a few of you dads that have dismissed some of your kids. Um, this manager found himself in hot water, to say the least. The manager says to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. Get ready for shrewd. So he called each one of his master's debtors. He asked first, how much do you owe the master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 400. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. I key in on that word. For the people, listen to what Jesus says. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have been if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. How many of you have heard that saying? This is where it came from. This is the context. No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees, 
who love money, heard all of this, and they were sneering, joking, poking, laughing at Jesus. And he says to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued amongst men is detestable in God's sight. Two great lessons I want you to grab. I mean, there are a lot of lessons that can be drawn from this story. But I want to give you two of them this morning and talk about them. The first, the wise use of opportunities. And the second, the danger of covetousness. The wise use of opportunities and the danger of covetousness. Would you pray with me? Father, as we look now to this passage of Scripture, Lord, we need help. We need your help in understanding this. I need your help in communicating it. And we need your Holy Spirit's help to sort it all out for us. And this morning, Father, we turn to you. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. There are a couple very great quotes that I want to give to you. I mean, they are quotable quotes. They're things to be written down, be remembered, and to be used again. And the first of which is, crisis doesn't make the man, but it shows what the man is made of. In the midst of this story, you see a crisis. This manager seemingly had a pretty good life. This manager seemed to be able to kind of come and go as he pleased. He was able to do things without a lot of supervision. And there came a time in which he was called into account. The boss comes in and says, I heard something this morning that didn't really sit with me this well. I want to audit the books, and I think you're going to be in trouble. Can you imagine your heart going up into your throat at that moment? I mean, there are some of us that when we get called into the manager's office, our heart goes up into the throat before he even says a word. I mean, he might be saying, hey, good job, here's an extra $100,000 for you, then your lump still is up in your throat. Before he even opens his mouth, it's sort of like getting sent to the principal's office. They say one of the most stressful things that a person does in their entire life is stand up in front of somebody, and the second most stressful thing that ever happens to you in your entire life is going to the principal's office. I wish the principals understood how stressful it was, that they, but I think they utilize that to their advantage, the shrewdness of the principals. If you don't happen to know, you can all turn back there and see one of our local principals, but I poke at her this morning just a little bit. The crisis does not make the person. Hot water does not make you tougher. But it really does show what you're made of. What do you do under stress? Really shows the kind of person you really are. The second one that I want to tell you is Christ used these topics to teach very important spiritual lessons. And the big question that I ask every time is, have we learned anything? Do you learn from your mistakes? There's nothing wrong with making mistakes. There's a major thing if you don't learn from your mistakes. I poke at old Vern here flying airplanes. You know, there's nothing wrong with making a mistake as long as it don't kill you. If it kills you, you don't get a chance to learn anything. But if you make it through the mistake, you definitely don't make that same mistake again. Put air in the tires before you try to land the thing. Check to make sure there's gasoline in the tank. See if there's any oil in the thing before you start it up. I mean, things that you learn along the way, right? You got the point. Believers who make wise decisions with right motives accomplish much for the kingdom of God. Understanding that this parable tells us that God has the ability not just to look at the results, not just to look at the efforts, but to look at the motives that we're operating under. When this steward discovered that he was facing a crisis, the, the boss was auditing the books, and he was going to lose his job, he knew he was in trouble. He made the wisest use of the situation and in doing so, prepared for the future. This steward was able to make the most of his situation because he responded properly to the insights that came to him in the crisis. For the first time in his life, he could see things very clearly. And this morning, I want to talk about being in the midst of a crisis. 
It is very difficult that while you're in the crisis to learn anything. Did you know that? That while you're in the midst of the crisis, it is very difficult to learn anything. At that moment, you know what we are? We're tunnel vision. We are one-minded. We, we have one thought and one thought only. We've got to survive the moment. So if we're going to learn anything about dealing with crisis, it better start being ingrained within us before we face the crisis. Do you see what I'm saying? That's the reason why we don't put novices in places of leadership. That's the reason why you don't take the first person off the street and put them in a place in which they're going to get themselves in trouble and fall. You train people. You develop people. But there are five items that become extremely clear in this little parable when he came face to face with a crisis. Five little points. They're very simple. You know, and by the way, somebody needs to say even this. I, I don't, I'm not going to deal with all of the lessons of this parable. We would be here till tomorrow talking about it. But we're, I'm, I'm just one, facing crisis. And in the midst of the crisis, to be prepared for that moment, right now, start thinking, how am I going to handle the situation? And when in the midst of the crisis, this individual saw himself. When crisis came, he suddenly realized that he was a steward. You know, it's a mistake for us to think of stewardship as just money given, like tithes or offerings, because it's much better to think of stewardship as a believer as everything that I own belongs to someone else, and I am the manager of it. A steward is a manager, and to be a good manager means that we use the things that we have in our possession in its greatest possible good. That means our cars, our tools, our houses, our clothing, everything that we have. Stewardship means much more than, I remember growing up in Sunday school, and they gave you these little envelopes, and they says, be a full-fledged Christian. You know what it said that? It said that right on now. Be a full-fledged Christian. And it had all of these little things to check off. And if you did all these things, you were a full-fledged Christian. I wondered, what if I'm only a half a Christian? Is there such thing as a half of a believer? You know, because as I look at did you memorize your Bible verse, you know? Did you give your offering? Did you come to Sunday school? Did you ask somebody to come to church with you? There was about five or six things here you had to check off. And if you did all those things, it said on that envelope that you were a full-fledged Christian. And I always thought it was interesting that they gave you that as an envelope, meaning that they expected you to put something in the envelope. And I always wondered if they didn't worry too much about what I checked off on the outside as much as they worried about what I put on the inside. Stewardship is much more than just giving money. Stewardship means management. How do you manage your life? How do you manage your time before God? When you stand before God, He's not going to ask you, did you give 10%? He's not going to ask that question. Now you notice that I talk about this after we took the offering. God doesn't ask you what you gave as far as material. Listen, he wants all of you. You see, and this means, what did I do with all of what God gave me? And so when you talk about this idea that in the midst of crisis, I get to see myself clearly, it's this idea that I don't own anything. As a manager of what God's given me, that's all it is. It's God's, it's God's, and I'm managing it. I get the privilege of managing it. In this respect, he represents here every single one of us. This little manager got called into account. The owner was God, and we're the managers. We're the stewards. We're the ones that have been given this great responsibility. How have we used our time? How have we used our talents? How have we used the gifts and abilities that God has given to us? What have we done with this great gift of eternal life and the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ? And as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we don't own anything. We simply have been given things to manage. In the midst of the crisis, this steward saw himself. That really, he didn't possess anything, but simply managed it for the owner. Also, he saw his life, didn't he? He got the big picture of things real quick. The parable was given just after the parable of the prodigal son, or the wasteful son, you might say. And when you put these two ideas together, you find three different philosophies in life. In the, in the prodigal son, in his philosophy, he says, eat, drink, and tomorrow I'm going to die. It doesn't matter what happens tomorrow. This is the only day I have. I'm going to use this day to its fullest. I'm going to get everything I can for here and now and not worry about tomorrow. And the elder brother, 
He represents a different philosophy of life. He, he, he looks at a spent life. He's the drudge. I mean, he's obeying the Father, but he's not doing it because he wants to. He's doing it out of obligation. Do you live your life with no joy, no happiness, just work? And you don't even enjoy that? And then here are the steward, the steward of an invested life. Instead of destroying his future by living only for the present or destroying his present by hoping for the future, he could live the present in the light of the future. Now, I want you to tell you something. Now, Jesus didn't approve of the, of the way he did. He didn't say that. He commended him for what he did. He didn't necessarily say, this is a great idea. You need to go do this. But when the crisis came, the master asked for the books to be open. And the steward saw his life in this brand new light, and he realized that he'd been wasting his life and living a lie, and he calls his, his master master for the first time, and he realized the money that he had been managing is really the master's money, and this money is a marvelous thing, and this steward is now realizing how terrible he's been doing things, and he wakes up to the fact that he sees his life and flashed before him. Have you heard this story? I, I fell out of the airplane, and my life flashed before me. I hope you really didn't fall out of the airplane, but you've had those moments in which you were in the midst of crisis and it looked like it was going to end right then and your whole life flashed before you. The seriousness here of the question deserves some serious thought. If I'm in the midst of a crisis and I now am faced with just a few days here on this earth, if I had that opportunity, what would I do? I don't know if you've ever been faced with that. Have you ever had the time in which you sat in the doctor's office and they looked at you and they said, you better get your affairs in order? And what do you do? I've thought of this several times and I think of Mark, Jay's youngest son. At 20 years old, he was facing terminal cancer. And they look at him and they say, there's nothing we can do. Now at 20 years old, what do you do? I commend him that he didn't rob a bank. It might be interesting to rob a bank, but he didn't do that. He came to church. He started thinking about things of eternity. He started thinking of the seriousness of the moment. Would your priorities be anything different if you faced that tomorrow morning as you walked into the doctor's office? What would you change? And I guess as a preacher within me, sitting here saying, if you would change anything, then why are you waiting for that opportunity before you change it? You obviously don't need more information to make the change. You already know what you're supposed to be doing. We already know more than we can ever handle. We already know more than what we could possibly do. So the question here is that I need more information to make any... We already know. In the midst of crisis, we're often put into the place where we have to look at ourselves and examine our life. And then we see that this guy saw the master. I don't have any reason to believe that the master was a hard man. I don't believe that the master was a crooked businessman in any way. I think that when he heard that his steward, the manager, his employee, had been cheating him, he immediately called for the books to be opened. I think he could have had the guy arrested, thrown into jail. Instead, he just said, you're fired. Between the time that he was fired and the time that he got news out that the manager was going to be fired, this manager calls in the tenants and he lowers the rent. He made friends for the future. He proved that he was shrewd, capable of acting under pressure and under fire. And up to this point, he considered his master a soft touch, some distant person not to be dealt with. And then all of a sudden, when in the midst of the crisis, he realizes there is a master, there is a moment in which I am called into account, and now other people around me are important. And he started working the business. He had forgotten that his stewardship involved both responsibility and privilege along with accountability, and at this moment, he was called into account. And so what's the point? I say that often when I listen to people. So I wrote it right down here in my notes. So what's the point? As Christians, we have tendency to forget that one day we're going to have to give an account to the Lord. We have a tendency to kind of forget that. 
You know, we like the idea that, you know, one day the trumpet's going to sound and the dead in Christ will be raised first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And we say, praise God, come on, Lord, come now, John. And John says, come quickly. And we say, amen. And we forget the fact that at that particular moment, we're called into account. What did you do with the time that you were given? I think Christians need to remember that the judgment here isn't necessarily about their sin, but what did they do with what they were given? And to realize that to those of us who were given a lot, which is almost everybody in here, in comparison to materialistic things in this world, it's every single one of us have been given a lot, much is going to be required. When these truths became apparent to this steward, he made some radical changes in his life. When he realized that he was going to face the auditors, when he realized that that afternoon he was going to have to look eye to eye with the master, he started looking for opportunities for the future. He started seeing, how can I manipulate this so that the future will be the best for me? And he saw that living for people was the most important thing and not for things. That brings me to my next idea, the next thing he saw. After he looked at himself and he looked at his life and he saw his master, he started looking at his possessions. Before the crisis takes place, the steward lived for things. But he learned that the things are not the end in of themselves, but rather just a means to the end. I've heard it said that money won't buy you happiness. And then they say, well, you don't know where to shop. And that might be true, but I know this is a fact. Money won't give you satisfaction. It doesn't. I think Virginia and I were much more satisfied when the day came that we made $6,000 a year than $60,000 a year. I think we were much more satisfied. I think life was a lot less complicated. And it seems like the more that you accumulate, the more you have to worry about. All of a sudden, it's important that I have a security system. I never worried about a security system. I never had anything in the place that I was worried that anyone would take. Because no one would want my junk. They'd go get better junk somewhere else. But all of a sudden, somebody said, you've got to have this security system. Money will never satisfy. As soon as it gets a scratch on it, it's no good anymore. I had a three-year-old daughter that loved hot dogs. As soon as she ate one bite out of it, it was broken and you didn't want it anymore. Throw it away. It's broken. We're the same way. We're just older and more sophisticated. There's a lot of lessons to be learned in this little story, isn't there? Some of them that I don't like looking at because I have to examine the way I think and what I do. The steward discovered that his wealth was only a means to an end, and that helping others and investing in the future was what the most important thing was. Now, we might not approve of the way that he did this, but we certainly look at the change in his heart that caused him to do it. He saw his possessions in a brand new light, and he began using them in a brand new way. And that's my point. In the midst of crisis, one of the most important items that we need to see are those around us. And in this case, he saw his friends. Before the crisis, he used his friends to rob his master and line his own pockets. And now he realizes that his friends could really be his friends, that he could welcome them in, that he would somehow be welcomed into their homes when he got out of a job. And he could help them out right now. He could actually use his position to help someone else. I'm wondering in the big picture of things, how many of us have been given the position that we've been given really so that we could help someone else? And that if we stand before God, he's going to say, the reason I put you where you were was so that you could touch others. Now Jesus isn't suggesting that we get our friends involved in some kind of crooked deal. It is amazing how many times I've been called on the telephone to say, Don, you've got a great personality, and I just know there's a, there's a line coming behind this. You know, when you start out with a compliment, you know that there's, someone, there's a hook in there somewhere. I want you to come over and look at this opportunity. You know what I'm talking about? 
You know, if we get 12 people together and these 12 people could get 12 people and then those 12 people could get 12 people and they all use this bar of soap. Some of you have been approached by those ideas? I'm not suggesting here that Jesus was using this as some idea to get friends involved in crooked deals or even shady deals or any kind of deals. He was reminding us that we must use the opportunities that are in front of us to make friends for heaven's sake. Jesus closes this lesson by emphasizing the importance of faithfulness. And he points out that Christians have two kinds of wealth, a materialistic wealth and a spiritual wealth. The, the material wealth is that manna, the spiritual wealth is God. The, the material wealth, wealth is that which is the least, and the spiritual things are that which really has lasting value. He calls it unrighteous manna and true riches. And as a believer, we have two kinds of wealth. This world only has one thing, here and now, and what they accumulate. But I guarantee you that in a hundred years, everything that is accumulated will be out here in the city dump and have no value. But those things that have eternal value will last forever and ever. I think there's a couple great spiritual lessons that are being taught here. I know that I could come up with many more. And I know that if we sat down in a little discussion group that we could come up with even others. But the one that stood out to me is that you, if you trust a man with a small amount and he proves himself faithful, you can trust him with a little bit more. Which tells me the opposite's true too. If you can't trust somebody with a little bit, why are you giving them more? A person who is unfaithful with material things can't be trusted with anything spiritual. I think there's a direct relationship between how a person uses their money and the way they minister to God's truth. Recent days, we've heard about the guy that had two homes, one in Palm Springs or one in, in uh, Southern California and the one here in Tulsa. Whoops. The temptation of praise from men has to be seen here and the approval from God. If God's the owner of all things and I'm just the manager of it, and all these people I come in contact with think that I'm doing such a wonderful job, but God's not happy. I'm in trouble. It doesn't matter how many people around me are saying amen, praise God, hallelujah. If God isn't saying that, it ain't worth diddly. Somebody walk away from here saying, well, you know, that message talks about riches and that a believer is not supposed to be rich, and that somehow riches are sin. I don't think that at all. That's not what he's getting at. He's talking about management. Using those things that God has given us for his glory. Now I ask you a question. Where do you fit in the story? If Jesus is talking about you, and you find yourself in this story, are you one of the Pharisees that are sort of at the end snickering and sneering at him and poking fun at him? Could be. I thought about the, the, the three different philosophies of life that were given here, the, the prodigal son and the elder brother and, and this steward. Do you fit in one of those? Are you living only for today and nothing for tomorrow? Are you living today but it's a drudgery? I'm doing it out of obligation. Are you living today with the opportunities that are laid before you, laying up treasures in heaven. In the midst of the chaos of a crisis, you won't have time to get your notes out to see how you're supposed to respond. You know that? And right now, we prepare ourselves for the moment in which we stand before the owner and he says, give an account. The books are about to be open. An audit's going to be given. The wise use of these opportunities. So that in the midst of the crisis, you see yourself. You see your life. You see the master. You see the friends around you. And you say, God, this moment, has been given to me to glorify you.
Let's pray.